guys for coming um, to our lecture today. Uh, my name is Ramya. I am the Citizen Science Coordinator for the Key Biscayne Community Foundation. Um, for those of you that don't know, we do have uh, science-based and environmental lectures uh, every third Thursday of the month um, that may occasionally change depending on holidays and stuff like that, but we try to aim for the third Thursday. Uh, today we have with us Dr. David Dia. He is a professor at Rasmus. Um, he was also the chair of my committee when I did my master's degree. Uh, he did uh, research during ULTRA to see how the shorebirds that, that uh, live on and visit uh, Key Biscayne and Virginia Key may have been affected. Uh, so he's going to talk to you today about that and let you know a little bit about the shorebirds and the, uh, the, their migrations, things like that, and then any possible effects from ULTRA. So with that, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Ramya, and thanks everybody for coming, especially to the Key Biscayne Foundation and the Key Biscayne Citizen Project. They help us do the, the research and uh, also want to help Dr. Lu, who's here, say hello. He is the uh, other scientist that worked with me on, the, on, the, on this project. He's a specialist on uh, acoustics and, and electronics, so he helped in, in the side of the project that relates to the sound and measurements that we made. So I'm going to give you a bit of a story first of the, some of the birds and, and animals that we have in, in Key Biscayne and Virginia Key. I don't know how many of you know, how many of you can guess how many di different species of birds we have just in Crandon Park? Any idea? 20, 30? A hundred? <laughs> well, the, the citizen scientists, these are not just scientists, uh, but citizen scientists have reported 245 species in Crandall Park alone. Okay, and these are, these are some of them. These are just some of the ones that are, you can find on the beach. And I think some of you may recognize some, some of the herons and the egrets, the cormoran, the seagulls. These you may not know the terns, but these are the ones that dive from far uh, and uh, catch fish. And then the shorebirds uh, that I'll be talking to you about today. So there's about 30 species of, of shorebirds. Uh, these are birds that live mostly in the coast, but some of them actually also live around rivers and lakes in, inland. But obviously, the ones that we see here in Kibiscane are the ones that are mostly around the beaches and the mudflats. And uh, they are the ones that probably, if you walk on the beach, you see large flocks of them. Other than seagulls, it is likely that they would be these little guys. The shorebirds, the plovers. You see there's several species of plovers. This one, which is super, very pretty, the, the stilt and a lot of the what we call uh, pip, pips, the sanderlings, sandpipers. Um, they're kind of hard to identify, but uh, they're really interesting. And uh, they're all protected. Uh, some of them are actually in danger, and one of them in particular, the piping plover, is an endangered species, and I'll speak to you guys mostly about it today. So, so the story that I'm going to be telling is mostly about the piping plovers, although in the research that we did with Dr. Lu, we actually study all these different species and how they were affected by, by ULTRA. So these guys, you can see them on the dry sand during the high tide because they're resting. They just sit on the dry sand and they rest their energy. They can't feed when there's high tide because the food uh, that they eat is on the edge of the water, on the mud flats, and on the edge of the beach. They eat worms, they eat little crabs, little shrimp, and small snails, so that they move in and out of the dry sand as the tides change. And they form these flocks that you know, some of you would have chased when you walk on the beach and they, they fly away. This is a picture of the sand flats in Virginia Key on, on the bear cut side of Virginia Key. And these are photos of the, the piping plovers of, uh, in, Cran of, in Crandon. The title of my talk was Snowbirds. Anybody knows? What, what, do, we, what do we call snowbirds? Come on. Say that again. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. But what, what are they? What, what kind of animal are they? What kind of animal? They're Canadians. They're New Englanders. New Jersey, those are the, the snowbirds, right, that, that most of you are familiar. Kind of like these guys, right? <laughs> these are snowbirds, all right? Uh, in fact, you know, they are a very important part of, our, of the Florida economy and a lot of the southern economies. You know, they're people that basically live up north and when the cold weather comes, they come here. They come here for a few days or those that are lucky enough to own a condo in the key, they come here and stay for the, you know, for the whole of the winter and part of the fall. These are the snowbirds that most people think about. Uh, but they share a lot with the real snowbirds. The real snowbirds are the ones that I'm going to tell you stories about. They are these little birds that come from, like the people snowbirds, they come from the northern US, from Canada, and they come down here to Florida, to the, to the Gulf Coast, and to the Caribbean to spend the fall and the winter. Because they are like the snowbirds. They don't like particularly the cold. And they prefer to be here in a warm place when it's cold up north. So they nest up north. So they nest up north. They nest in Canada. Some of them, like uh, this guy, the Sanderlings, nests in the Arctic. Uh, north of the Arctic Circle, in the, in the Canadian islands of the n far north. This, the piping plover, which is the one I'm talking to you about, I'll tell you, nests in the uh, northern US and southern Canada, and in the Atlantic Canada. So they build their nest up north, they raise their young up north, and uh, when the, the young chicks are just a few weeks old, they come down south uh, with the adults, believe it or not. How do you think we know that they do this? Well, there's people that see them up there, but also because some of them are banded, as you can see here. They carry these little bands of plastic that, we, that the biologists up north mostly put on the, on the birds. Most of them, they put them when they are just chicks. When they've just come out of the nest and they are starting to walk, they put their bands and they stay for you know, basically their whole life and allows us to identify individual birds. And therefore, we can tell, for instance, that this guy, this guy here is coming from the prairies, from South Dakota. And this guy is coming from the North, North, Northern Canadian uh, provinces. So they're flying thousands of miles. Yes. Of course, you are all allowed to ask questions. Uh, okay. How long does it take for them to clean the A few weeks. In a few weeks, they come down. They, some of them, they fly. They fly uh, you know, hundreds of miles in one go. They sit in a place which is nice, and then they go another jump and fly another few hundred miles. And uh, you know, some of these guys have been that that come into Key Biscayne. Some of the piping plovers have flown 1,800 miles, and they do that sometimes when they are less than two months old. So those of us that are proud to have taken our kids, you know, across the Atlantic <laughs> on planes, they have it easy. These guys have to do it themselves. They got to fly all the way down here uh, on their own. So this is a piping plover up north building its nest right on the sand. This is the one that I'll talk to you a little bit about why is it in danger. But this is, you know, it's a, it's a male building the, the nest right on the sand on the beach. So they live exactly in the same place, type of places that they live up he, down here. It um, makes a little hole. It decorates it with a few rocks and pieces of, of, of uh, seaweed so that the female likes the place. And then she lays the eggs. And in a few weeks, they, they hatch. This gives you an idea of how they ban the chicks. These are chicks. These are three or, three or four days old chicks that they put bands on them and uh, release them back on the beach. The mother doesn't like them. They must be one of the cutest things you can see. 
And after a few weeks after this, they're down here. Believe it or not. Back to the story of the piping plovers. There's actually uh, five populations of piping plovers that we distinguish by the place where they nest. So there is a group that nests in Atlantic Canada, another one in the US side of the Atlantic from uh, Maine and down to North Carolina, population in the Great Lakes, population in, in the prairies in Canada and in the Great Plains of the US. So we, so the number is the actual number of pairs, of nesting pairs. So the number of birds is about twice that. And you can see there's not a lot. So there's only about 160, 150 birds in the Great Lakes. That population there in the Great Lakes is the reason why they were declared endangered. Because in 1986, there were only 17 pairs of Great Lakes piping plovers. And it, uh, they were declared in danger, and the other, the other populations were declared what we call vulnerable. Vulnerable it means that if you don't take care of them, they may become endangered. So they're still also protected. And the reason for dying is to do with man or? It's, yeah, completely human. Uh, they were in the beginning of last century and uh, uh, end of the, uh, the 19th century. They were actually hunted for feathers, believe it or not. There was such a big market for feathers everywhere that they hunted this for feathers. But later, it was mostly because of development on their on beaches and shores of lakes where they normally live, and that, that the populations dramatically decline. But they've been protecting since 1986, and they've uh, risen quite a bit. So the Great Lakes population is now about three or four times, three times what it was, or four times what it was. But it's still, you know, it's still, you're talking about only about 130, 140 birds. Uh, so very small. Uh, and we call them populations for two reasons. One, because they are managed independently. So we take, try to take care of the Great Lake birds, but also because they don't mix. So when they nest, they nest only with Great Lake birds. They pair with only Great Lake birds. There's very little exchange between populations. No, so most of the birds actually, they <coughs> tend to nest in the same place, in the same beach like the every year, and they uh, winter in the same beach every year. So they're pretty fixed on, on the Are conditions. They Are they monogamous? They, no, uh, what, we've, what we know is that they do change uh, pairs. They don't always pair with the, same, with the same female or the same male. Some of the birds do that. Some of the birds of prey, big eagles, are uh, completely faithful to their partner, but these guys it can change partners between years. So when they migrate down, they come to Florida, they come to the Texas coast, they come even to Mexico, Yucatan, and some to the Caribbean. They all migrate down from the north. They do that in the f migration that happens between July and October. And once they're here, every four years, they count them. It's part of their way to make sure that the, the protections are working. So we count, we have a winter census every four years. The last one, well, there was one in 2016, but they haven't yet published the results. But in 2011, they counted basically 4,000 birds all together. That was all that they were able to count. And you know, when you sum the, the population of, of nests, uh, doesn't get that far, it's about 5,000. So they, they count most of the birds, uh, they're able to locate most of the birds when they come south. Now, the ones that we see here in the key, we actually see birds from the four of those five populations. We th see birds from the Atlantic Canada, from the Atlantic US, from the Great Lakes, and the US and the Great Plains as well. Uh, it's a special place, Key Biscayne is like the Snowbirds, the real snowbirds. We get people from Canada, but we also get some people from Michigan, right? So they are the same kind of snowbirds that the, that the ones that come here and spend money. And these are the ones that visited us last year, uh, the ones that have bands, and we can recognize where they come from, because not all the birds that are here for the winter have bands. They band a very large number of birds, but not all of them have bands. But of the 17 or so that were here, most of them were actually coming from New York and Long Island, where there's a lot of banding. 
uh, being done. So, but again, like how many New Yorkers you know and new people from New Jersey that, that love Key Biscayne? Lots of them, right? <laughs> so it's like, like the piping plovers, but some are Canadians, some are from Michigan, from uh, South Dakota, uh, and they all come down here. And uh, most of them are rather young birds, you know. Most of them were under one year old, the ones that we saw banded yes, last, last this early this season, uh, you know, this last winter. But they were up to five year old uh, birds for sure. They live about 15 years. The ones that live, uh, the, the record uh, oldest birds that we've seen are about 15 years old. And how many eggs they achieve? About uh, two or three year eggs normally survive. They can have about four in a nest, but often only about three each time. Yes, in fact, uh, sometimes they put cages over the nests the same way that we put cages over the sea turtle legs to protect them from raccoons and, and some of the predators that, that are putting pressure on, on the populations. They don't all come at the same time, and some are summer arrivals that get here in August and stay here till March, and some come later, and that come in October and March to March. But there's also some uh, transient birds, birds that you see for a few days they stop over in Crandon Park, they don't quite like it, or they see it's too crowded, and they, go, they continue their way maybe to the Keys, to the Caribbean, to the Bahamas. So in the flocks that you see here, you'll have summer arriving birds, you'll have some fall arriving birds, and you'll have some transient birds. For instance, now, they were the beginning, uh, late summer, uh, about two thirds of the birds are gonna stay here, the ones that you see on the beach now, and about uh, one third of them are going to move, keep moving somewhere else. When the fall comes, you will we'll have also the fall arriving birds, and uh, most of them will stay here for the winter. There'll still be a few that are passing by, and once you are in the winter, about two thirds are summer arrivals, and uh, a third that are winter arrivals. So if you see the flock, this is time, the season, and this is the number of birds. The flock in Crandon Park and <coughs> Biscayne. You know, you see the increasing in numbers. Now we're in the middle of August, so we have about 20 birds on the beach. And then they're gonna climb up to a little bit over 30. Uh, you'll have some of these transitional birds that are passing by, and then they'll, they'll be the fall arriving birds that, that will make it, and we get a flock close to 50 birds here that spend the winter piping plovers. That's it, no more than 50 birds. By the way, f yes? And they never nest here? No. They come here only to eat and, and rest and, and uh, get away from the, from the snow and the, and the cold weather. So, uh, and uh, the Crandon Beach is the one that has the most wintering birds in the whole of the east coast of Florida, believe it or not. So it is, it is very special. Uh, if it wasn't special, they would go somewhere else. Say that again? Eagle. Eagles. We have ospreys that are year-round, the, the, the one that, that catches fish. And we also have some, um, an, uh, uh, sometimes an American eagle shows up. They're not common. But we have quite a lot of raptors, what we call eagles and hawks. Yeah. Many of them pa pass through Kibiskane as well. Okay, so I've, I've spoken enough about birds. I'm gonna change subjects now. You know, I, I'm not gonna talk just about birds. I'm gonna talk also about the concerts and ultra. So uh, how about these photos? What do, what do they, what do you think represent? What do they rep represent in one word? Come on. Nature, come on. Seasons, what else? Time of the day. Eh? Time of the day. One word, one word. Landscape. Landscape, there you go. These are all landscapes, right? These are views of the environment, all different views of the environment, and they are over land. How about these? What are these? Oh, yeah, my, my colleague knows already. Seascapes, okay. You're, you're, you're cheating. 
although he hasn't seen the presentation. But these are all seascapes. So it's the same kind of word, landscape, but it applies to views of the environment, but in the ocean. How about this one? Soundscape. Soundscape. That's right. That's right. So this is a soundscape. And this is what we studied in this project. We study the soundscape, which is all the sounds that describe an environment. OK? This, you're hearing the bird sounds in, in, in the soundscape, but it would be also the waves and all these sounds that characterize the same way that what we see through the eyes, we can characterize as seascapes or, sounds, or landscapes. We characterize the environment also according to the soundscape. And part of our study was to think about the soundscape. Okay, so what we did is try to answer two questions. First question is, did the ultra concert uh, change the soundscape of beaches in Key Biscayne and Virginia Key? Okay, and the second que question was, if it did change the soundscape, did the changes in the soundscape affect the shorebirds? Okay, so those are the two questions that we were contracted to do uh, by the Key Biscayne Foundation and that the community and, and Key Biscayne was interested in and that we were interested in. Okay, so for that we did a study and we did the study in the two places where there are, these shorebirds are most abundant, the Bearcat area, Bearcat Beach and the Sand Flats that are on the southeastern side of Virginia Key, and the southern Crandon Beach where these flats, those of you that walk the beach would know the flats that are in front of the um, southern part of Crandon Beach. So we conducted bird surveys uh, every few days before the concert, during the concert, and after the concert. And we put microphones on both Virginia Beach, uh, Virginia Key Beach and Crandon Beach in order to uh, characterize the soundscape. And with that information, we try to answer these two questions. So in order to characterize the soundscape, you, can, you do a recording. You put a microphone. And in fact, I, I have the microphones here that we use. They are very simple, very cheap. But they actually do a great job. You know, all they are is this. You put it on the beach, and it records all the sounds. And as you know, sound, they're just waves. And uh, they can come in different frequencies. The waves come very fast, one next to each other, like the ones in the ocean next to each other, or very far apart. When they come next to each other, they are of high frequency. It means you have a lot of waves in a little short time. When they come far from each other, you have low frequency. And this, in this axis here, in the vertical, is a frequency. So these are low sounds. And these are high pitch sounds, low pitch sounds and high pitch sounds. And you can see that we are measuring then, then what types of sounds we have in that uh, soundscape. And in the color represents how loud the sound is. So red means a very loud sound. Um, black or purple means very faint. So, and that's measure with decibels, which is a measure of the power of the sound. Okay. So high decibels means very loud. Low decibels, not loud at all. And you can see in this, um, what we call spectrogram of sound, you can see that there is very little power, very little loud sounds in the high frequency. That most of the sounds are in these low frequencies. Okay? So that's part of saying what kind of soundscape we have. So, if you look at the lower part of the spectrogram, so before I was showing you all the way to 10 kilohertz, now I'm showing you only to 5 kilohertz, or so 5,000 sounds, 500 uh, hertz. hertz. You can see that now you have a few more greens and a few reds and yellows that start popping up. So most of the soundscape here is characterized by low frequency sound. There's not a lot of high pitch sounds. So most of the graphs that I'm going to show you are from only the first uh, kilohertz, the first 1,000 hertz of, of the sound. And here, now, you start seeing some features. You see these sounds, these noises that come. This is 
time in the x-axis, so this is over an hour of recording on the 11 p.m. in uh, the night uh, before the ultra in Key Biscayne Beach. And you can see these big sounds coming through that over a range of frequencies. And then you have a little bit more here up in the higher frequencies. Uh, but this is a typical recording before the ultra. So again, this, that was uh, 11 p.m., so 11 at night. So this is, again, a typical sound. Uh, this is on 3 p.m., so in the middle of the day, on the day, before, the day of the concert, but before the concert started. And you have all these features here. They look pr reasonably similar. They extend over a lot of frequencies, and they're pretty loud. They're red. It's about 25, 30 of them that put signs about when these, each of these sounds showed up in the, in the um, soundscape. Any idea what that may be? What may be? No idea? Yeah, who said airplanes? Let's see. Let's see if they were airplanes. So, so, yeah, airplanes. The airplanes arriving and departing into Miami Airport that flying over Virginia Key and Key Biscayne every day, every three or four minutes. You may not have noticed or forgotten about them, but if you are on the beach, you see them every two or three minutes, especially at peak times. You see here, they're every five minutes or so, there's a plane going overboard. And they dominate the, echos, the, the soundscape at the beach. They are the loudest things on the beach that you can record are the planes coming over and over and our you sky. How those sounds affect the, the fauna, the birds? Well, if, if they did affect them, it would be very hard to, for us to answer because they're now and, and they're, they're always there. They're part of the soundscape. They dominate the soundscape. They are the, the, the biggest noise that you, they, these animals hear uh, any day at, at most times of the day. There's another one here that is you know, a lot more red, a lot louder. What do you think that is? It's another plane, but it's a fighter plane. So we just happened to record a fighter plane coming through, you know, it's uh, over a lot shorter time because they fly much faster and a lot louder. So again, it's another human sound that is, dominates the soundscape on these beaches, fighter planes. But there are still some sounds uh, in the higher, slightly higher frequencies. You see the, here these that come as greenish, bluish. Uh, these are also part of the soundscape. These are the birds. These are the piping plovers. So the, the soundscape in the beach still has some natural sounds, dominated by human sounds, but it still has some natural sounds. Those are the ones that I like, I must say. The, the, the bird sounds are the ones that I like. So these are the plovers, and these over there are actually seagulls uh, also calling. So each of them has a different signature. Obviously, if you hear it in the recording, you can, and if you know birds, you recognize what kind of bird. But you know, if we do the analysis, because of the frequencies, we could also assign them to a particular bird species only by doing the analysis without actually hearing it. OK, so the second question, now that I've said, OK, it does change the soundscape. But did it actually ultra change the soundscape? So that's the second question. Did it, the first question, did ultra change the soundscape? We've, I've told you how we characterize it. Now let's uh, think about whether it did change the soundscape. You guys think they changed the soundscape or not? Yes. Yeah? Yeah? No? No? Well, certainly in the next to the stage, for sure it changed the soundscape, right? Next to the stage, you had this big noise, and some of the, the people here, I'm sure, actually liked the music that, that they played. And uh, for sure, it's changed the soundscape where these people were, because that's the reason why they were. That's the reason why you had 125,000 uh, young people, mostly, that came 
to, to Key Biscayne over three days is because it changed the soundscape the way they like the soundscape, which is this uh, uh, music. But did it change the soundscape on the beach? That's the question that we wanted to ask. So these are the same um, recordings, uh, spectra, for before and after the ultra. So this is not when the ultra is during the period of the ultra, but not when the concert was in. So this is the day, bef the morning before the concert, and the morning after the concert. On the top part, you have uh, Virginia Key recordings, and the bottom part is Key Biscayne. And if you look at, a, at the same day, do you see much difference between Virginia Key soundscape and, and, and Key Biscayne? There's a little bit more noise in Key Biscayne, but you see that the, the actual sounds are the same. They mapped, and that's because it's the same plane. Still, the soundscape is dominated by the planes, and all you see them is possibly a little bit louder on the Key, in the Key Biscayne side because they maybe the, the flight path took them more over Key Biscayne rather than Virginia Key. So before and after this, the, the concert, the soundscape was not that different between Virginia Key and, and Key Biscayne. Now, a different thing happened once the music was on. In the top, again, you have Virginia Key, and the bottom was Key Biscayne. So Key Biscayne hasn't changed that much from what we, you were here seeing on, in the mornings. But Virginia Key, definitely, you have all this loud sound here that shows up in the spectrogram. And that's the ultra music. So clearly, and this is at the beach, not right next to the stage. This is at the beach. At the beach, the sound, soundscape changed dramatically as a result of the concert. And this is in the middle of the concert, at 11 PM at night, uh, during the Friday and during Saturday of the concert. So soundscape definitely changed in Virginia Key Beach as a result of ultra. So that's the, first an the answer to the first question. There's, so it changed the soundscape. Did it affect the birds? So in order for us to, under to see that, I'm showing you now, this is the number of birds for since January till December of piping plovers in Crandon Beach. And these are data from citizen scientists. And I'm, I'm especially proud to show this in a lecture about citizen scientists. These are not data from uh, professors like me. These are people that like birds and that give the data to the Cornell uh, University lab. So you can see that you have lots of birds at the beginning of the year, and then they start declining in numbers starting February. By the end of April, by the end of April there's none left on our beach on Crandon Park. And then they start coming back in August. You know, and every year they change in numbers, but every year you have the same pattern. The, the stars here, the black stars, are actually the data for this last year, for the, since uh, January till uh, April, the data that we collected as part of the study. And you can see also the same pattern, that they are high numbers at the beginning in February, and then they start declining. And this is an important thing, because that actually determines strongly the result of, of our work. So this is now part of the, what I've just shown you, but this is just the birds this year. The gray bar are the weekend of the ultra. This is the dark gray is the weekend of the ultra. Before the ultra, light gray, and after the ultra. Remember that they were still building all the stage. They were doing sun, sun trials, sun tests prior to the, sorry, prior to the ultra concert. So there was changes in the soundscape there as well, probably. But what you see in blue are the number of birds in Crandon, and in red, the number of birds in uh, Virginia Key. And the reason for that is that these birds actually move from Crandon Beach to Bearcat. They are the same flock. You know, these birds normally, once they get to a wintering area, they move within three miles of that, of the, of that beach. They can move back and forth from the mud flats, and, and, but they don't move far further than that. So these are actually the same birds, the ones that are, sometimes they are in Virginia Key, sometimes they are in, in Key Biscayne. So in the days where we actually counted them uh, pretty much at the same time, within an hour, you can actually calculate the total flock, which is at these black dots. So the black dots represent the total flock. And again, there's about 47 birds. And then they start declining. And uh, by the end of April, there's none left. And what you see is that during Ultra, 
These are the mornings of Ultra. They were birds both in Crandon and both in Key Biscayne. We could not um, do the surveys in the middle of the night. Uh, my wife wouldn't let me do it. Uh, no, she would. She would have. But we, it was not safe. Uh, you know, the beach was all under police, and, and but we did we did uh, survey them during the day of the uh, of the weekend of the ultra, and the birds were there. They were both in Virginia Key and in Key Biscayne. So uh, that answers part of the question. Did they did ultra completely chase the birds? No, it did not completely chase the birds out of either Virginia Key or Key Biscayne. In fact, they just decline, the decline in birds in 2019 is the decline we see every year. They just start migrating north at the, at the middle of February, and by April, they are away out of here. So we're pretty sure that this is a normal migration. What we saw this year in Virginia Key and, and Key Biscayne is the normal migration and concluded that the answer to that second question is that there wasn't a strong effect in the abundance of piping plovers. I cannot say on whether they were stressed out because of the music, that we did not do that kind of study. There were other colleagues that study stress on fish, but we didn't do that on birds. We just, say that again? Maybe they were dancing. It's t entirely possible that, like, like snowbirds, some of them like the music. In fact, there's been some studies that show that birds prefer classical music to, to uh, yes, sorry kids, but they prefer classical music to um, rock and roll. What can I say? I know, ultra is not rock and roll. What is it? Electronic music. To electronic music. They haven't done that study. The study is from 20 years ago, so, <laughs> of 10 years ago. So they did compare rock and roll to classical. It was the Brits. You know, the Brits are, are, are crazy about birds, so they invent all kinds of studies. So the main conclusions from this study is that first, it did change, the, the ultra did change the soundscape in Virginia Key Beach. It did not change it in Key Biscayne. And one of the reasons is that during that weekend we had dominant southeasterly winds. So all the noise was thrown into Brickell and Coconut Grove and didn't come this way. If we would have had northwesterlies, it would have been a different story. We would have probably heard it. Certainly us in the Commodore would have been jumping, right? Like the, like the people in uh, Brickell in Brickell and, and Coconut Grove. They did, it did change the soundscape, uh, but the piping plovers look like they just did what they do every year. They stayed and gradually move out and move north by the end of April. If anything, we see a hint on the observations that they may have moved away from Virginia Key into Crandon. So they could have been chased a little bit from, from, uh, from Virginia Key, but they didn't migrate north. I mean, it wasn't big enough of, an, of a disturbance to make them go back to the snow uh, er, too early. So, they, so basically, we were able to answer those two questions. And I think we were very happy with the results. But obviously, it wasn't the uh, birds hate ultra kind of thing that some people <laughs> expected. <laughs> But, you know, science is not about getting the answer you want. It's getting the answer that the data shows up. Okay. So that's it. That's my story. And I'm sure that, I, you know, I hope that you have some questions. Again, uh, asking and uh, thanking the, the, the Kibiscane Foundation, the university, and the uh, Citizen Scientist Project. Remember the motto of the Citizen Science Project. Learn, experience, participate, suggest projects. And uh, of course, make sure that we take care of our beach. We have to learn to share it with birds, uh, but we can. You know, these are birds and people fishing together quite happily. Thank you. So now you know about plovers <laughs> and about ultra. Yeah. Like stick to birds. When I walk to the beach, I see this little flock going back and forth, and they mix and they come. I mean, 
I, I throw myself on the floor of the sand <laughs> with binoculars and um, okay. patient. And I spend, you know, half an hour and an hour to just count one flock. <laughs> yes, yes, you have, to, you have to spend time. It's like everything in science, you look, sometimes from outside it looks, oh, these marine biologists, I'm a marine biologist, must be, you know, spending all their time diving and all that stuff. Yes, but a lot of this time you spend a lot of long hours and, and but if you if you like it if you're thrilled about it time doesn't go fast time flies when you have time flies yeah. that's right that, that's right yes rumia um, did you try to get like gain any data about any of the other bird species in the area or did you just concentrate on piping plovers no i have the data for all the others uh, for uh, many of the other shorebirds so i have for the sanderlings, for, and uh, we haven't done a full analysis on all the species, but of, uh, of the ones that you see here, we analyze semi-palmated plovers, ruddy turnstones, black belly plovers, and sanderlings. These are the most common that we They are the most common that you have here. These are in the hundreds. Then no, you know the flocks are much bigger. They you, know, you can see about 300 of these, about a couple hundred of these, and uh, they don't all migrate at the same time. So this this turnstones are actually stay here for longer. Uh, they might they come here later than the plovers, and they stay here for longer. So these were all quite happy during the ultra. They were in Virginia Key Beach, and they didn't they they. They were not disturbed. I mean, none of the species showed strong disturbances by the concert. Oh, none of the species that we that we monitor. Did you study any of our local birds who stay here all the time, like the pelicans and the seagulls? No, I, I we had intentions of of uh, looking at some of the ones that actually nest. Mm -hmm. There are some that nest during that period of March and April, but um, it was. So so much harder. We, don't, we, we could not locate uh, records of nesting, nests. We wanted initially to monitor nesting birds during the, that would have been nesting during the period of ultra. But there's only a few nests that have been identified in Virginia Key or, or, or Crandon Park that we could actually place instruments and monitor them. Do the, so. Were there any studies of the fish? Yes, there were studies of the fish and studies of water quality and studies of, um, the that's it, fish and water quality. Yeah. So on the fish, they basically uh, brought some uh, toadfish, which is a, a fish that lives in the bay on the bottom. Uh, not a particularly nice looking fish, but very interesting because, so because one of the reasons that it studies is because it vocalizes. It actually talks to, to each other, you know, between fish, they talk to each other. So they communicate with sound. So it was a good animal to work with. And they did experiments where they brought them to our facility in Virginia Key, that we have an aquaculture facility. They put them on tanks and put them in water and they measure the physiology, the stress levels, so the, the hormone, hormonal levels in the blood. And they uh, did these measurements before, after, and during the event, and they showed that they got stressed by the music. So they got stressed uh, uh, by the music. Stressed to higher levels than they uh, tend to. Than normally with, with uh, the predators. they're being chased by predators. Yeah, so they, they were quite scared of the, of the music, during the music. Maybe they hear differently than the birds. You, you, with, you, you withdraw blood. You withdraw blood from the, from the, from the fish, and then you, you do the analysis of hormonal levels. Sorry, you had another question. No, no, I'm saying that maybe they, their hearing is different. They hear different. Of course, underwater, underwater, the sound dissipates very quickly. So, you know, if there's the planes, uh, you don't hear them that much as soon as you go to slightly deep waters because the sound slows, you know, the waves slows down and a lot of them are reflected. So, um, 
one of the, 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 the issues about these experiments that were done in the lab is that you know, the, the water depth was relatively shallow. Not all the fish live in that sh very shallow water. And they, some of them live in deeper water. And the ones that live in deeper water probably were not that affected and not that stressed because the sound doesn't reach the bottom of the, of the, of the channel, of the bear cut channel or the bay. But if they were in shallow water, they would have been stressed, like the, like the tanks like uh, showed up. Like the ones. Yeah. The ones deep, no. the ones deep we, we, we didn't, we were not able to measure the ones that are deep because it's very hard to catch them. You know, if they live on the bottom of the, of the bear cut channel. Unless you have a cage to put them in. Yeah, you would have had to have a cage and put them down. Yes, it, it would have been uh, oh. nice to do that. We had some uh, microphones underwater that were able to pick up some of the, the ultra music right in the middle of the channel. Not very strong signal, but it did change the, the, uh, the, the soundscape uh, at the bottom of the channel in bear cut slightly. But most, there, most of the noise is dominated by passing boats. So the, the boat traffic is what dominates the soundscape on the bottom of the, of the cut. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you.